You're listening to Choose FI Radio. The blueprint for financial independence lives here. If you're looking to unlock the secrets to financial independence and early retirement, you're in the right place. Stay tuned and join a community of like-minded people who are getting off the hamster wheel and taking control of their lives in the pursuit of financial independence. Choose FI, your home for financial independence online. Hey guys, today on the show, very excited about this episode, we are going to be talking with Gene Chatsky, the financial editor of NBC's Today Show, an award-winning personal finance journalist, best-selling author, host of Her Money Podcast, just released a new book titled Women With Money, and we asked her to come on the show and chat with us about your money and your relationships. And I think this is the key. This book is incredible, and while she's very clearly speaking to women, I got value from this because relationship and money is everything. It's your, it's your personal relationship with money. It's your relationship with your spouse and your partner with regards to money, your kids, how to raise someone that's financially independent or will be not financially entitled and your relationship with your parents, because all of us inevitably at some point will have that role of caregiver or many of us will. I think this conversation is going to be so valuable. And to help me with this, I have my co-host Brad here with me today. How you doing, buddy? Hey, Jonathan, I'm doing quite well. Yeah, I've been looking forward to this for a while. Like you said, relationships are everything. We've been talking about that on Chooseify from the very first. And I think Gene's book does a wonderful job summarizing all the different aspects where relationships, especially your relationship with money, comes into your life. So this should be fascinating. And like you said, I've been getting a ton of value out of her podcast. I subscribed and I've been listening weekly. And it's it's a really great, even though it's her money, right? And clearly there's a particular audience. I think not the target audience, Brad. <laughs> <laughs> no, maybe not, but it's really applicable to men for sure. So yeah, with that, Jean, welcome to the podcast. Oh, thank you guys so much. Thanks for digging into the book and thank you for having me. I'm thrilled. So you're writing a new book. You've already got a couple under your belt that you've written. Like what compelled you to tackle this project again? The Her Money podcast actually led me in this direction. And for those of your listeners who don't know, we had an episode featuring you guys. And so, of course, they're fans and they should dig in. And that would be a great place to sample us and get a taste for it. But the podcast, which has been on now for a couple of years, has just taken on this life of its own. And it's led us to launch a hermoney.com website and a Facebook group and to realize this thirst that women have for an ongoing conversation about money. You know, it's natural to you guys at this point. It's natural to me because I've been doing it for such a long time, but we just don't talk about money. We, we don't talk about it. We're desperately uncomfortable with it. And it is a life skill that we need to have because it impacts everything. And so that inspired me to say, yeah, I'm going to go back. I'm going to talk to these hundreds of women who are in my community. I'm going to figure out what we really want, what we're missing, and I'm going to put it in a book. Gene, I'm curious, in all your decades in this financial realm, do you have any sense of why we're so uncomfortable talking about money? Why is this the last great taboo in American society? I think the reason it continues to exist is that it has always existed. And that is a terrible, terrible answer. But if you look at the sexual revolution, there was this charge of millions of people saying, we are going to put this on the front pages of the magazines and the newspapers. We are going to write sitcoms about it and create Broadway musicals about it. And that just has never happened in the world of money. There's also this sense revolving around money of shame. Sometimes we feel ashamed because we've got not enough and we feel unsuccessful and we don't want to talk about it for that reason. Sometimes we feel ashamed because we have too much and we feel guilty and we don't want to talk about it for that reason. And so what 
we've done with the Her Money podcast, but also with these live Her Money happy hours that we've been having around the country, these just small groups of discussions with women about money is saying, here is a place where this is what we're going to talk about. We are going to schedule this. This is a time we're going to do it. We're going to do it even if it's uncomfortable. It's giving ourselves permission to talk about these things that we're uncomfortable talking about. And sometimes that's what it takes. Yeah, that's something we've hit on that just talking about this normalizes it and it just makes it part of part of life. It doesn't have to be this taboo. And I think when people feel, when they hear a podcast like yours or ours, it becomes part of their life and they want to talk to friends about it. That's what we've found. This is a message that spreads. And I'm curious, what are the biggest hurdles facing women financially? The wage gap is still a big one. We are still not paid equally for the work that we do in many cases. So that is a level set that we have to eventually blow past. And I personally think that although there is some systemic change underway in terms of more transparency from corporations, the one woman at a time approach of talking with other women, being open about what is a fair salary, sharing your salary. And often the easiest way to do this is on your way out the door. People don't want to come into an office and see the colleague at the next desk and realize they're making more than they are and hating them on a daily basis. But as you leave a particular job, sharing that information is a really, really good time to do it. The other big hurdles facing women are the fact that our lives take different arcs and we are still the ones who take time out from the workforce to care for kids. In most cases, we are still the ones called upon to be caregivers for our parents. In most cases, you know, those things make us take a step back financially. And there are many, many things that we can do in advance. We can prepare for to accommodate those changes in our lives, but we really do have to be thoughtful about making it happen on a regular basis. That's interesting, Jean, because when I I was actually talking to my wife before we started this podcast and asked her, what do you want to ask Jean about? And she was talking specifically of the impact of staying home with kids and leaving the workforce. There are significant challenges. What do you advise the women in your Her Money groups to do about this? I advise them to keep a foot in And I know that that's a little bit controversial because, look, there is no more important job than being a parent. And if you've got the sort of financial life that allows one of you, and it doesn't have to be the woman, to be at home with your kids during some or all of their years when they're still living in your house, that is amazing. But I know personally and through the podcast, so many women who get to the other side of that time out of the workforce and say, I wish I didn't. I didn't understand what I was doing to my resume, what I was doing to my contacts. And so when I say leave a foot in, I don't mean that you have to work full time. I don't even mean that you have to work part time. I mean that you need to keep your contacts refreshed, that if you can take on the occasional project that keeps you in the database of people in your industry, if you can maintain your LinkedIn profile and attend networking events, just don't disappear. That's my big advice. And don't think of it as all or nothing. Don't think of it as well, I want to go back to work. And so I have to go back full time. You you don't have to do that either. There are so many more opportunities these days to figure out a way to consult, to figure out a way to be a little flexible, to figure out a way to do something a few times a week, or even to take on a project. I mean, companies these days 
especially small ones, like the idea of having contractors rather than employees to boost their rosters. It's it's less expensive for them, and they can tap into some of this amazing brain power that's existing on the sidelines. So don't dip all the way out and try to give yourself the leeway to think about it in a more flexible terminology and arc than maybe you have been. You know, I want to come back to this idea of getting paid what you're worth because you have a lot of valuable content on this. But before we do that, I wanted to go back a little bit and talk about this idea of your money and your relationships, and in particular, your relationships with yourself, how you engage with yourself, identifying emotional triggers, and kind of some of the variants that you saw in your research between how men interact with money and those emotions and how women interact with money and emotions. Can you give us some of the insights that you've gleaned while putting this book together? Absolutely. The book is called Women with Money. The subtitle, which is a mouthful, is The Judgment-Free Guide to Creating the Joyful, Less Stressed, Purposeful, and Yes, Rich Life You Deserve. And I called it Women with Money, not Women and Money, not only because there is already a book called Women and Money, but also because women just have more money these days. I mean, when you look at the arc of women and the share of assets, wealth, spending, all of those things in the United States that we've we've got, it is on the rise, headed through the stratosphere. That is why it's so important that we learn to understand ourselves with money. And it has to start with that emotional question. I asked women, what do you want from your money? That was the very first question that I asked the hundreds of women that we interviewed for this book. And I asked it intentionally in a leading way without giving any sort of multiple choice answers. And what I heard over and over again was this need for safety, this need to know I'm okay, this need to know that I'm secure before I could move on to absolutely anything else. And if you look at that, women, we are often feeling a lack of power in the world. I found this fascinating study on women walking home at night and how dangerous that often feels. And this need to protect ourselves, this need to satisfy our emotional need for safety and security is, I think, at the heart of pretty much all of a woman's interactions with money. We need to respect that. We need to acknowledge it. We need to satisfy it because that's the only way that we can then allow ourselves to get all of the other things and do all of the other things we need to do with our money. Now, with that as sort of a level set, the other thing that really impacts your emotions around money is your own personal money story. I, I In the book, I call it the most fascinating story you've never read because many of us have never looked at it. It's not the lessons that your parents taught you about money. It's not the save, share, spend jars that they put on your dresser because they wanted to teach you that you should save some and spend some and give some away. It's the atmosphere around money that existed in your household growing up. It's the fact that there was tension around payday. It's the fact that one of your parents tried to solve problems by throwing money at it. It's whatever existed. And even if nobody talked about it with you, you took it in. And I guarantee if you haven't looked at it, acknowledged it, taken steps to understand it, it impacts the way you handle money to this day. Jean, we found that that personal stories really make the world go round. That's what we've hit on with Chooseify, that, that these personal stories are so important. And I'd love, if you don't mind, to hear a little bit about your personal money story and also where this need for safety and security have shown up in your life. Yeah. So I was a list maker very early on. I write in the book about having this very boozy conversation with a, a college classmate friend of mine on the night before graduation just on the porch of a, a house in West Philadelphia. And 
laying out my entire life plan for him. And I, I basically said, look, I will be engaged by the time I'm 25. I'll be married by the time I'm 26. I'll be running a magazine not so long after that. I'll have my first child by the time I'm 30. Like boom, 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 boom. I had it all, all laid out. And it didn't happen like that. The the magazine business changed. I had trouble getting a footing when I wanted to get a footing in my career early on. I am divorced. I have two kids and I am happily remarried, but I certainly wasn't planning on that. And learning that you have to be resilient enough to sort of roll with it and how to roll with it is really interesting. I mean, that need for safety and security showed up big time in my life when I got divorced. And listening to these other women, I was really taken by how my own behavior has been dictated by that, even though I haven't always realized it. So when I got divorced at age 40, I was intent that I was going to buy a house. I was leaving the family house. It was much too massive for me to, much too big and old and plumbing for me to handle. And my ex-husband really loved it more than I did. So I was leaving that house. I was moving about a mile or two somewhere in the same town and I was going to buy. And I, I, I was not even considering the fact that renting would have been a smarter financial move. This was at the height of the real estate bubble. I, I, I wouldn't even hear it because in my mind, I wanted a place that nobody could ever tell me again that I had to leave. In fact, when I got remarried, my new husband said, we'll refinance. I'll buy in. I'll pay some of the mortgage. And I was, I said, absolutely not you know, this is mine. You can't have it. You can't own it. And he thought it was ridiculous, but you know, he went along because this was clearly a very strong emotional need of mine. It also showed up in the amount of saving that I was doing at the time. I just started saving automatically, which as we all know, is the best way to make sure that you actually save what you want to save. But I started saving automatically for every goal, living far below my means. And for a lot of reasons, this is why the FI movement and Choose FI are so intriguing to me. I think even if you are not going for full-blown retirement, at a very, very young age, there's so much that the rest of the world can take away from the tenets of the FIRE movement. There's there's so much that we can learn. And during those years, early on, and to some degree it has continued, I was saving a, you know at least 50% of my income, if not more, because having those savings put away was the only thing that made me feel secure. Wow. I, I love your perspective. And I want to go a little bit deeper, especially with regards to emotional triggers. You mentioned one of yours and in your research, like one of the things that we always try to communicate for our audience is actionable takeaways. And we know that emotional triggers in many cases can lead to very damaging outcomes for someone that's listening to this, that knows that their emotions have made them make some incredibly reckless financial decisions. What do you recommend for them? How can they navigate this lane? So in the book, I've got a whole list of emotions, moods, feelings, and what they tend to cause us to do. I mean, it's pretty interesting that you can isolate the particular emotions and the actions that often result. So if you look at something like anger, for example, you would think anger might make you slam a door and shut yourself in a room, but anger actually makes us more optimistic and more likely to take risks than we would normally take. So if we get angry, we could go out and make a very risky purchase, spend more money than we would normally spend. We also might invest in something that's not necessarily a wise move because we're feeling angry and we're feeling jazzed up. And it's being conscious of yourself and your emotions and what you tend to do in response. If whenever you're sad, 
you head for the ice cream or you head for the mall. I mean, those are things that you should be able to notice about yourself and then try to recognize, I am feeling, you know, I I had a bad day. I'm feeling sad. Try to be a little more conscious of it. It, It's funny. I've been talking a little bit about my podcast, about how I started using the Headspace app at the beginning of the year. And one of the things that the monk whose voice is in your ears as you're meditating on a regular basis tells you is to try to get a a bead on what your emotion is that day, what you're what you're feeling in that day. How does it how is it showing up in your mind and in your body? And I think that's very true of our financial behaviors as they relate to our emotions. We have to train ourselves to recognize what we're feeling, whether we're feeling it physically or emotionally. Yeah, I personally love the Headspace app. And yeah, Andy Puttycomb's voice is just so wonderful in the ear. It's it's extraordinarily relaxing. So just as an aside, I, I definitely recommend that to everyone. But most importantly, we're talking about emotions around money. And you're talking about the money story. I'm curious how you can understand your partner or significant other's money story. On a very concrete level, how do you advise people to have this conversation? It, it reminds me almost of, of like the five love languages, right? So everybody has their own money story, but how do you really dive into it when this can be so taboo? In the book, I have exercises that you can go through to basically pull your partner's money story out of them because you're right. There's this other person in your bed. If you are not understanding where they're coming from, much like if you're not understanding where you're coming from, you're going to have trouble communicating and you're going to have money fights and money disagreements. And there's a lot of tactical stuff that we can do. And I'm a big believer in financial autonomy. I think every person needs to have some money that is under their own control, that even the person that they love more than anybody else in the world cannot tell them what to do with. And it shouldn't be an amount that is budget busting. It should be, though, an amount that is meaningful enough that you can make some autonomous decisions about the things that are important to you in the realm of spending and saving and even giving it away. We, we don't all agree with our partner's choices of what's important to do charitably. But on a different track, knowing where your partner is coming from and why they react the way they react is really, really important. And so it means sitting down and asking questions about what was the environment like in the house where you grew up, you know, was it fraught with tension? Was there this feeling that there's plenty or this feeling that there's never enough? What was your mother like with money? What was your father like with money? Really digging into those things and trying to remember not just what was said, but how you felt when things happened then sharing that with your partner. We can do these exercises as individuals. We should do them as individuals, but we should also then make it a point to not hide that information from our partners because we know that when things happen in our romantic relationships, when when things go sideways in our romantic relationships, when it comes to money, that's when relationships fall apart. And and there's a lot of statistics on the fact that the more often we fight about money and the more often we disagree about money and the less respect we have for our partners as a good manager of money, the more likely we are to divorce. And having been through it, I can tell you, you don't want to go there. I wanted to dive into that a little bit further. One of the things I loved about your book is just your use of story. And in many cases, real life stories drawn from your community. You know, this example you gave, the $1,500 that he spends to wire the back deck for sound when he could have gotten a $40 portable speaker is, you know, cute to you at first. He's eccentric. He's evolved. He just wants, you know, the progress. But, you know, over time, that glow fades, especially in times of anxiety or stress or money situations. And you talked about having a framework. Let's dive into that. What does that framework actually look like? If someone wants to have an exercise and they want to ask questions about, 
you know, your backstory, that sort of thing. Can you help us flesh out a little bit further what a framework for this type of conversation is? And is it a one-time thing or is it something that follows you throughout your marriage? It's definitely not a one-time thing. It should follow you throughout your marriage. It doesn't always have to be that backward look. I mean, the point is you get comfortable enough understanding by doing these sorts of exercises who this other person is that you then understand, just as you understand why when you're angry, you react in a certain way, you then understand why when your partner's angry, he or she reacts in a certain way. It gives you the ability to say, okay, I I get that this is what's happening. I get that this is why it happens. This is the way, this is the way it is for him or for her. And I'm going to press pause on the way that I react to that because I get it. It, It's really a matter of understanding. But for a framework for these discussions, really, really important that it not be a time of tension. And that's true of any conversation, right? You you don't want to be talking about money and your older parents with the entire family at the table at Thanksgiving. You know, when you're alone with your mom and you are peeling carrots two days before Thanksgiving and everybody's happy and everybody's calm, that's a really good time to have a discussion about money. I talk in the book about how having these conversations is not necessarily easy for me. I mean, I don't know about you guys, but even people who do this all the time sometimes find it's not easy to talk about money with the people that we love the most. And so my husband and I will schedule it. We'll basically say, we're going to do this over the weekend. The weekend works well for us because we can both exercise in the morning, which you blow off some steam. He plays tennis. I go for a run. Then we come back. Then we have some coffee. We settle in. We get the errands out of the way. And sometime before we are getting ready to go out to dinner later in the afternoon, there's an hour and we can say, okay, we're going to do it then. And we've also found long car rides work well for us. Somebody can take notes on a legal pad, which help helps us remember what we've talked about and what we want to do. And knowing that you don't have to accomplish everything in this discussion, but once a month, maybe once every couple of months, when there's a big transition coming up, Doing these sorts of things is having these sorts of conversations make sense on a regular basis. And it's important to focus on the good stuff, not just the bad stuff, not just when you do this, this makes me crazy. But what do we want from our money? You know, what are our goals? What do we want this year? What do we want next year? What do we want in five years? What's our timetable? Because that stuff is the romance in money and money's not always fun, but that stuff is fun. Then charting out how we're going to do it together, what we're going to both have to do, what changes are we both going to have to make and how are we going to tweak things in our lives now so that we can make these things happen. That's fun. Yeah, Jean, I liked in your book how you described this concept of these money dates and also kind of how you sheepishly admitted that that you were the one who didn't really especially love them. And it's funny, one of our uh, guests, Andy Hill from Marriage, Kids and Money, he described these money parties that him and his wife have and just they make it like a fun game. And I think that's how my wife, Laura, and I look at this also. It's especially the whole concept of, of financial independence, of, of winning together as a team. Like we mm-hmm. find this so empowering that we get to really work together on a daily, weekly, monthly basis to win at life. I know that's yes. kind of a funny way to look at it, right? But we're winning at life by just being smart financially. I absolutely agree. And I love the money parties. I mean, that's that's in a lot of ways what my Her Money Happy Hours are. They're gatherings. In our case, they're women. But I, I gamified it. I, I developed this set of playing cards, essentially, that asks questions. And the way we play, we we go around the circle. Everybody pulls a card and starts talking. And the conversation chimes in. And People just don't want it to end because you haven't done it before. And it feels, I mean, one woman said it feels revolutionary. By the time we're done, they're all exchanging, because I do these in different cities around the country when I travel, they're all exchanging numbers to get together without me. You know, they get it. They want to do it some more. 
once you have a taste of it, it's a little bit addictive. Let's talk a little bit about bringing different lives together. So you mentioned that this is your second marriage and in particular, you're both bringing in different incomes. You're bringing in different expenses. You essentially have completely separate, fully developed lives that you're then merging together. And then now you're starting out with these types of money conversations. What challenges did that present? What solutions did you come up for doing that? It's interesting. In both of our prior marriages, we mingled all of our finances. And in our new one, we mingled basically nothing to start. And it's because we came to the relationship as these fully formed adults. My husband was in the process of paying for college for his two kids. My kids weren't even in college yet. And so he he had these massive expenses. And I knew that in a few years, I would have massive expenses. But right now, I was in the process of just shoving as much money as I could into the 529s to pay for my half of those massive expenses. So we started completely separate. Over time, we have merged a little bit, bit by bit. So I got really annoyed when we would go out to dinner and one of us would pull out the credit card and then the next time the other one would pull out the credit card. It just felt, I I know this is maybe a little backwards and old fashioned, but it felt very unromantic to me. I didn't like it at all. So we got a joint credit card that we both pay off together and a joint account for our household expenses that we fund proportionally with our incomes. I I earn more than he does. So I put more money into that account every month than he does. And we use that to pay the household account and we, you know, reevaluate as we go forward. As we're looking into our future, I could see a scenario where we even merge more. We will probably in the next couple of years uh, sell this house and buy an apartment. That will be jointly owned real estate because I've gotten it over myself. And we will probably end up merging more. But I think the point is, and, and I outline in the book, I go through a number of different financial systems that are working well for couples. Some are merging everything. Some are merging part and doing this yours, mine, and ours account thing. One woman in the book talks about how when she stopped working to stay home with her kids, her husband said, well, just come up with a sum of money that was about equal to what you were earning. I'll dump it into your account each month, then you can use it to continue to pay the expenses that you were paying, which were a lot of the the things for the children in the family. And she says, look, I get an allowance. It is completely retro, but it works really well for us. My feeling is great. Figure out what is going to cause the least stress in your relationship and do that. And then if it no longer works, figure out how to change it up. When it comes to our money and our relationships, we need to be a team of two. And we need to shut out the noise from the outsiders, the family, but also the experts who tell us we're doing it wrong. If it's working for you, it's working. Yeah, that is great advice, Jean. And this is interesting because this is actually a topic I've had that I wanted to talk about on Choose a Five for months now, actually since we all went to the FinCon conference. I vividly recollect this conversation I was having with a couple of, I guess, millennials. They uh, they were in their 20s. They looked at me like I was this old geezer because Mm -hmm. I combined my finances with my wife and we did from the very first. And I guess amongst their friend circles, no one does that. And I was so taken aback. You know, it, this is just interesting, right? Because you never know what goes on in other people's financial lives. And that's what's so interesting about normalizing this conversation. And I'm curious, like, have I know you're saying, obviously, whatever works for you. Clearly, that's the most important advice. But have you found any particular method that you would advise generally as a starting point? Or is it just, hey, just have the conversation? So I am a fan of this yours, mine, and ours system for a couple of reasons. 
First of all, I do think this issue of autonomy, of being able to spend some money without asking permission is really important. And you can get at it in a number of different ways. If, if you've merged your money and everything is coming out of the household account, you can draw an arbitrary line in the sand and agree with your partner that you are not going to spend more than this without discussing it. You know, that's a way to get at the autonomy. And as long as both people in the relationship are respectful of the budget and the savings goals and spending obligations that have to be met and aren't leading the other one astray by doing so much of that autonomous spending that it's going to hurt the family's finances. I think that that works just fine. But I have learned, and I think, again, this is very important for women because we haven't traditionally been the investors in the family, that having money in your own name, having investments in your own name, having credit in your own name is vitally important because only when you feel like you have table stakes, do you step up and manage that. We all have to learn how to invest because when you look at the stats on the people who are remaining single and also divorce and also widowhood and longevity, it's really apparent that women are going to be on their own at some point in our lives, the vast, vast majority of women. And so not knowing how to invest, not being comfortable rebalancing your 401k or having a conversation with a financial advisor if you decide that you want one or checking your credit, like that stuff's not okay. It's just not okay anymore. And so if having money that you are going to manage yourself is what it takes to get to the point where you feel comfortable doing it yourself, then, then you gotta, you gotta separate at least those accounts. And from that perspective, it's a good thing that IRAs and 401ks are individual accounts. I'd like to dive a little bit further into the your, mine, and ours, which, which I love. And in particular, I want to tie it to this idea of financial infidelity and the relationship between those two. So financial infidelity, I, I'm sure you guys, like me, every year around Valentine's Day, get a ton of surveys about financial infidelity and how common it is. And it's really just lying to your partner about money. It's little things like putting on an outfit and your partner says, oh, is that new? And you're like, no, I've had this forever. When in reality, <laughs> you you bought it last week and you cut the tags off and you threw them away underneath you know, all the other garbage so that he or she wouldn't see them. But it's also having a secret stash, having secret accounts, having secret debt that your partner doesn't know about, which can take the family in a, in a terrible direction. And then it's massive things. You know, it's Dirty John. I just completely binged that entire series on Bravo. And it's incredibly frightening how treacherous if, if you are in bed with somebody who is a truly dishonest person, life can become. So yours, mine, and ours does encourage more eyes on the money. It does encourage both partners to be actively watching the flows of funds. And, and that's important anyway. You know, it's important because so much goes by these days electronically that mistakes happen. And identity theft is a huge, huge issue. And having more eyes on what's happening on a regular basis, that's a good thing. Do you think that yours, mine, and ours actually, so there's different types of financial infidelity. There's the small stuff, right? And then right. there's the big stuff. And it's important to make that distinction. Do you, do you feel like yours, mine, and ours gives us ability to take the cutting the tags off stuff and bringing it in the house and normalize that conversation and actually make the relationship stronger? Yes. That's the purpose of yours, mine, and ours. The purpose is to give yourself and your partner the freedom to be able to do the things that you want to do as individuals without having to A, ask permission and B, feel bad about it. We, we have this misguided conception that just because we marry somebody, they want everything we want when we want it. And that's just not true. You know, my husband wants to 
spend money going to sports games that I could not care less about. And he should be able to do that. He should be able to use his time that way. And he should be able to use his money that way. And, you know, as long as I understand that these are things that are his priorities, I can allow them to be his priorities and know they make him happy and not feel that they have to make me happy. I'll get my satisfaction in other places. I want to come back and I want to circle back to this idea of getting paid what you are worth. And in particular, I want to talk a little bit about the wage gap and exactly how how we're establishing that, what that actually means. But then also there's this quote that I want to lead with, and I kind of, I really want to get your thoughts specifically on this quote from Marianne Williamson and this speaking directly to women, our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. Let's talk about that. So Marianne, who I got to know when we were both hosting radio shows on the Oprah and Friends channel, she's just amazing. She said this famously to Oprah and Oprah let the world know about it. And so it is It is a very, very famous quote, but it speaks to imposter syndrome. It speaks to the fact that if we were to allow ourselves to excel to the best of our abilities, we might be more successful. And maybe our friends would decide that they don't want to hang out with us anymore. And maybe our spouses would be threatened because we're out earning them. And maybe we wouldn't have time to do the things that we like to do now that our lives are a little bit simpler. I mean, sometimes we stand in our own way of financial success because we're afraid of the changes that will come if we allow ourselves to actually succeed. And I, and I have women in the book who talk about the fact that yes, this happened and yes, they had to deal with it. But I, gosh, I, I think having goals for yourself, wanting to accomplish things and not allowing yourselves to step up and do your best and see your ideas through is a pretty sad and demoralizing way to go through life. Let's go deeper with this. In particular, this idea of getting over the guilt and the fear of getting more. And I love the example, you're working for a nonprofit. You know, wouldn't that be the height of the arrogance for me to ask for more from a nonprofit that I work for? What's the frame for someone that, you know, is afraid of that power? Okay. First of all, can we just dispel with the notions that nonprofits don't make any money, right? Uh, Nonprofits are in many cases, incredibly profitable. So that's the first fallacy that we just have to get rid of. But the second thing is, look, if you are doing a bang up job for this nonprofit, this nonprofit is bringing in more money. And because you're there, it's being more successful and you deserve to be paid for that because otherwise you're going to be unsatisfied and you're going to take your talents to another nonprofit or another for-profit or or something like that. You earning more money gives yourself the ability to give it away if that's what you want to do with it. But not earning more is not allowing yourself to grow in in power and independence and and responsibility in the world. And so I think Asking for more is an art. Asking for more needs to be done on an appropriate time with a lot of information backing up what you've brought to the organization and why, in fact, you should be paid this much more, as well as factors about other companies that exist in your universe but not asking, sitting back, getting frustrated, and then not doing your best work because you're feeling resentful, that doesn't help anybody. Yeah. And this asking for more, I I jotted down in my notes for the podcast here, because this is not just women, right? Like while you talk in the book about it being a contributor for, for the pay gap, this afflicts men as well. And I know personally, I had a situation in my life almost identical to how you described it in your book, but 
I didn't ask for more. So I think there was one where, oh, we have we have room for a salary between sixty and seventy thousand, and they offer the woman sixty four thousand. But they're telling them, okay, there's potentially more room here, right? And I had an almost identical situation in my life, and I didn't ask for more. What advice do you have for that person who's who's scared, who's out there and knows that this is possible, but they don't know how to start the conversation? Can I just ask you a question? Why didn't you ask for more? <sighs> yeah, Gina, it's, it's a great question. I, I guess I, I didn't want to rock the boat. Maybe it was like a BS response from the VP of my department who claimed he was, quote, doing the best he could, right? Or he was trying to get me the raise and et cetera, et cetera. And, and I guess I was foolishly content with that for some reason. And one of the things you describe in your book is maybe getting another offer, right? Sometimes you have to go outside to really get your salary up there. And, and which is so sad. It's ridiculous that it comes to that. But, but maybe that's what I should have done. Well, that was the advice that was given to me by my boss. Hmm. So I had gone in, I had asked for more money. He said, I would love to be able to give it to you, but I have to justify it to my boss. And in order to do that, you need to go get another offer. He had so much confidence, I think, in saying that, in the fact that I really wanted to stay, which I really did. I really wanted to stay because I could have gotten another offer and I could have left. And when you go and you get another offer, in some cases, they won't match it and you do need to be willing to just go. I did. I went out. I got another offer. I brought it to him and he paid me more. I think what I learned from that was that there are a lot of different pressures, especially in larger organizations where your boss may not be the ultimate boss and they may have to give an argument to a higher up about why you need to be paid more money right now. The interesting thing about doing that, though, is that you really can only do it one time at each company. If you make it a habit you will eventually just piss people off. And my husband was a recruiter for a major media organization, and he would know which people were using him to get the other offer and then take it back to their company. And he would keep tabs on that. And those people would be dead to him for the, for the foreseeable future. So I, I also would just say that if you are getting the other offer from a company that you think you might someday want to work for, just be really careful. I would also be interested in your husband's perspective on people that asked him or didn't ask him for raises. He was really disheartened by women who didn't negotiate, by people who didn't negotiate, but mostly they were women. Mostly they were women, in fact, because his company was primarily women. But when he brought people in for jobs, he always left something else on the side, always left more money on the table than he offered them because he expected that they would negotiate. And when they didn't negotiate, he would come home and he would say they just took it. And his frustration would be palpable because he wanted to pay them more. This is so fascinating. And I want to actually, I, I want to, there's a story that both Brad and I are familiar with. And in particular, this is the Motley Fool. I want to give a shout out to the Motley Fool on this because they actually had, the founders had a, ask us for a raise day, come in and actually, and, and they've kind of, kind of been a vanguard for leading the culture on some of this pay transparency. But um, that's incredible to me. I never would have considered that in many cases, your employer or management actually want to give you a raise. And, and it, it's really cool. But I want to I want to take that and I want to come back to specifically talking about this wage gap. And I think it would be helpful for me. I think it would be helpful for women in our audience, men in our audience to actually understand what this is, because I think some of us may think, well, all right, women are going to make to make less over a lifetime potentially because of time out of the workforce. But my understanding based on your book and some of the other stuff that I've read is it's dollar for dollar less for doing the exact same work. And I'd be curious... <laughs> One, is that true? And give us some examples. And then two, where do we go from here? Yeah, it is true. There are absolute examples. Companies are starting to um, make some of this information public. Citibank, actually, City released information just recently that showed how it played out in their company. But 
right now the stats are that women earn 80 cents for every dollar that a man earns. That's an average. African-American women and Hispanic women earn significantly less than the 80 cents. Asian women earn a little bit more than the 80 cents, but no group of women has parity. Where we're coming closest is with millennials right out of school who are getting the same jobs that men get with, in some cases, the same salaries that men get in their first offers. What happens, though, is that when women get a little older and toward their childbearing years, the gap opens right back up again, because that's when we take that time off. That's when we step back from the workforce. That's when we start to feel guilty about the fact that we want to leave on Tuesday nights at six o'clock to make it to the baseball game, um, which by the way, men do too, but they don't allow it to impact their negotiating for more money. And we get less confident in asking for more money. And then there are some cases where even the exact same work for people who are relatively new in their careers is not paid fairly. There's a study of new doctors who right out of medical school, they looked at location, they looked at specialty, they looked at even apples to apples across the board, and the women are paid 19% less than men. So Jean, you're clearly describing this systemic societal issue. This is not something that's being fixed overnight, but as you're describing, there has been some improvement over decades, but we still have a long way to go. How do we move forward from here? How, at the very least, how do we find the range of salaries that can help us at least get this information to negotiate properly? We find it on the internet. There's a lot of information on the internet about what people are being paid at various companies, Glassdoor, Payscale, Salary.com. We find it by looking at want ads for jobs that are being advertised to people with our skill set. We find it by trying to talk to our colleagues. So I've been following the hashtag talk pay movement, which is telling people talk, share your salary. And it's controversial. You know, there's, there's Even no right question. now as someone that's not in my current job, I would feel a little bit guilty about going around spreading out exactly what my salary was for my position. And that's like, that's, that's crazy, isn't it? Well, I, I don't know. I don't think it's that crazy. I mean, I, I do, I, I'm an advocate for transparency. I think by sharing this information with each other, we help each other become empowered to ask for more. But, you know, I, I have been in big companies and have known that some people make more than me and some people make less than me. Would I have wanted to know, would I have wanted to share what I was making with them and then come in and see them on a day-to-day basis? I, I, I'm not sure. I'm really, mm. I'm really not sure, which is why I think this on the way out the door thing is powerful. Right. If you can, if you do it, and, and I'm not the inventor of this, a friend of mine, Meredith Rollins, who was the editor of Red Book Magazine, was on my podcast and, and she described when she got the job as the editor of Red Book, she was leaving, I think it was Good Housekeeping Magazine, but it might have been a different magazine. And there was another woman coming into her job as the number two at Good Housekeeping or whatever. And she sat down with that woman and she said, this is the amount you should ask for. It. This is what I was being paid. And she could do that because she was moving into a new job where she was earning more money. And the other woman used that to negotiate. I, I think that's where we do it. Maybe it should be, maybe there should be a reveal, like a gender reveal baby shower <laughs> thing when, when you have your goodbye party. Okay. What were you making? Right. Maybe, maybe that's the way to do it. And if you can normalize the conversation, if you can make that part of your culture, that's just what you do with your social group, with your peers. If this is just what happens. Wow. I mean, you can see how it would actually work, but you have, you have to start the dialogue first. Yeah. Absolutely. And that's true with all of these things. You know, whether you're talking to your your friends or your kids or your parents, I mean, money and friendship is really, it's really complicated. We all want to belong, right? We all want to 
belong to our friends in a way that we are we are valued, we're respected, we're an integral part of the group. And when our financial situation changes, that can, you know, sometimes that can be hard. My my colleague Kelly, who's my my co-host on the Her Money podcast, has talked openly about the fact that she has a lot of friends who are on Wall Street. They make more money than she does. Sorry, Kelly. And she's had to say, you know, I can't go on these beach weekends and spend $3,000. I, I, you know, that's not in my budget and hope that it doesn't impact her relationship with her friends. Jean, I can't express to you how much I've enjoyed this conversation. And frankly, it, it feels criminal that there's things that we're not going to be able to get to cover in this small amount of time that we have. Would you be willing, would you be interested in joining us on the show maybe later on this year and talking a little bit about money, your relationship with your kids and with your parents as a completely separate episode? I would absolutely love to. I think what you guys are doing is amazing. And um, yeah, I'm a huge fan. Anytime. Awesome. Well, on most shows, that would be the end of the episode. But on this show, Gene, we would love to give you the chance to tackle the hot seat. Are you ready for this? I'm ready. In a world drowning in debt and rampant consumption, trapped by the chains of lifestyle inflation. These questions highlight the secrets of those who have broken free. Welcome to the Choose FI Hot Seat. All right, Gene, question number one, your favorite blog that's not your own? The Cut. Ooh, tell us more. I've never heard of that, actually. The Cut is a blog website on New York Magazine. It's fashion, but it's fashion with an edge. They've got a great money column. I don't know. I'm always finding something new and interesting to read there. Awesome. Question number two, your favorite article of all time. Now, this can be one that you wrote or somebody else's. The one that made the biggest difference for me was an article years ago in the New York Times by an economics reporter named Louis Yucatel. I'm probably terribly botching the pronunciation of his last name. He's retired. But it was before the debt crisis by a few years. And he had dug into numbers to show that Americans owned less equity in their homes, their cars, and pretty much anything else than ever before. And it's what woke me up to the fact that we were heading for a debt crisis in this country. I turned it into a book called Pay It Down and pitched the Debt Diet series to Oprah for her show, which became like a seven episode arc. It made the most difference in my career, I think. That's incredible. So you you had a sense of the coming financial crisis years before. Did you take any concrete steps in your own life to uh, prepare for that? I had credit card debt coming out of college. I got a credit card. I spent too much on the credit card and it took me a little while at that point to dig out. And I had vowed I would never have credit card debt again. So from, from my perspective, I had already gotten good at managing my debt, but it definitely has shaped my views on the fact that I really want people to pay off their mortgages before they retire. As you look at even the the spending surprises that hit people in retirement, just knowing that your home is paid off is a great deal of inflation protection. All right. Question number three, your favorite life hack. I put on my exercise clothes the minute I get up and I don't take them off until after I've exercised. Wow. That's fascinating. So this is basically to make a habit easier, right? Do you find that you do this with any other aspects of your life? When I'm traveling for work, I I sleep in my exercise clothes so that I'm not only, (laughs) which is probably TMI, but I learned from Dr. Mike Royzen, who is my co-author on my previous book, which is called Age Proof, that you can even automate breakfasts and lunches. So I've found a couple of things that I like to eat for breakfast and lunch, and I just keep them on hand. That way I don't have to think about it and I don't have to 
shop for it on a regular basis. I always have it. It's always on the Peapod list. And I guess Peapod is another way that I do this, but, you know, it makes life a lot easier. And although I really love to cook, now I only have to think about cooking dinner. Yeah, I love that. Taking decisions out of your life. Just, yeah. I, I find it simplifies everything. And it's funny because actually just in the last week, I started doing precisely what you do is I lay out my exercise clothes and basically everything I need to get out the door to get to my 7 a.m. CrossFit class, I have downstairs. So I'm not fumbling around in the room and waking my wife up or anything like that. I just kind of slink out of the room, head downstairs. We have a, a shower down there. Like I, I'm all ready. And with and two young kids, it is actually slinking. That That is the appropriate <laughs> English term to describe Barrett before 7 a.m. <laughs> yeah, you, you wake somebody up, you're not going. So that oh, is, yeah. No, no, no. Nothing nothing good happens if I wake anybody up. So, yeah, that's really funny. All right, Jean, uh, question number four, your biggest financial mistake? Besides that credit card debt, which was expensive, my biggest financial mistake was pulling money out of a 401k when I switched jobs, which I did when I left my very first job. And I have gone through the painful exercise of calculating what it would have been worth had I not taking the money out and paid the taxes. But yeah, that was a biggie. All right. Question number five, advice you would give to your younger self. Don't worry that it's not the straight line that you think it's going to be. And we do have a bonus question for you. What purchase have you made over the past 12 months that has brought the most value to your life? A Peloton bike. Oh, mm -hmm. got the subscription. We have one other fella, uh, Chris Hutchins, that we interviewed probably, I don't know, six months ago now. And he also was raving about the Peloton service. Is it another one of those things taking decision-making out of your process? Yeah. And it also makes me feel like I can get my exercise in when the weather sucks. So I'm a runner. My preference would be to get outside and run, but I hate the treadmill. So I often, if it was raining, if it was snowing, I would just punt. But I, having the Peloton, I get on, I do the half hour or the 45 minutes. I, you know, I managed to do it twice a week and I really like it. I did a class before I talked to you guys this morning with a new instructor and I was just laughing with her. So it was, it was fun. You know, at risk of continuing this too far, I actually would like to highlight the idea of it, of purchasing experiences, not stuff, but okay. sometimes stuff can drive experiences, right? Well, yeah. And that is, I think, an important point that people, we get stuck on this concept of experiences. Experiences don't have to be theater tickets. They don't have to be vacations. They, they can be things you experience. So my Peloton bike is, is something I experience on a regular basis. So is a beautiful painting that lights you up every time you walk past it. Jean, I've, I've loved every aspect of this conversation and it's really covered the full gamut. Uh, you're the host of the Her Money podcast and I know that you have a, your website, hermoney.com is a wonderful community of people all pursuing these types of conversations. What is the best way for someone to connect with your content and to find out more about your book? Go to hermoney.com, sign up for our newsletter, subscribe to the podcast. You can do it all there. And specifically on the book, hermoney.com will get you there. But if you want to go right to it, womenwithmoneybook.com. And as of March 26, this book will be available, I'm sure, where? Anywhere the books are sold? It's already available on Amazon and barnesandnoble.com. And I would love it if your listeners want to uh, want to talk about it. And if any of them want to share it with their book clubs, I am happy to Skype in. Wonderful. Jean, thank you so much for coming on the show today. This has been a blast. Thank you so much. Brad, when we ask people, what is your biggest challenge? What are you struggling with? There's two themes that I see. One is how do I make more, right? How do I get my fair wage? How do I increase my income? And the other is how do I talk to my partner, my spouse about money? I mean, this episode, she kind of gave us a roadmap for that. Yeah, you're absolutely right. These are essential conversations. And yeah, Jean gave us a lot of flavor based on her background, her experience and her research. And that's invaluable to me and I assume to the audience as well. So yeah, this was really a great episode. And I just want to thank Jean for coming on. All right, to our audience, if you got value from today's episode, and if you've been getting value from the episodes up to this point, just take one second and press the subscribe button on the platform you're listening to this on. Just let the providers know you're getting value from the show and you want to be here when we produce additional content. If you want to support us and what we're doing here at Choose FI, here are four easy ways. One, leave us an iTunes review. To do that, just go to choosefi.com slash iTunes. 
too. Use our page to sign up for travel credit cards. If you want to travel the world with miles and points instead of your hard-earned dollars, then just go to chooseify.com slash cards and get started today. Three, if you're working on the milestones of Fi, set up a personal capital account to track your progress and use our affiliate link. It's completely free. And just go to chooseify.com slash PC. P is in Paul, C is in Cap. And four, and most importantly, find your friends, coworkers, and family members who might be open to this message and tell them about the podcast. Have them start with episode 100. It is a fantastic starting place. All right, my friends, the fire is spreading. We'll see you next time as we continue to go down the road less traveled. You've been listening to Choose FI Radio Podcast, where we help middle-class America build wealth one life hack at a time.